Here are five signal tracers. The three on the left are more or less vintage uh, signal tracers, tube-based, uh, designed in the 50s, manufactured into the 60s, uh, maybe even into the 70s, I can't quite recall. On the far right is a little bit more modern uh, solid-state signal tracer that also does signal injection. We'll talk about that in a second. And then down below, uh, you see in uh, here a, another little solid-state uh, kit that you can build. It's made by Alenco. I don't know if they still sell those, but we'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. So let's start over on the left with the, uh, the Knight. This is the Knight. KG690 signal tracer. The input is here. There is a magic eye tube and a speaker. There are a series of connections on this side that allow you to connect to the output transformer, both the input and output. Then there is a watt meter on the far right that you plug into this uh, outlet and adjust these are notoriously inaccurate, but you can recalibrate them by uh, checking and, and adjusting the resistor sizes inside. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, if yours is, is vastly inadequate, uh, for example, if you plug in a 60-watt bulb uh, into this and it reads uh, 150 watts, well, it probably needs recalibration. Speaker switch to turn the speaker on and off. And then these two are the sensitivity controls. This is the step control. This is the variable. Basically, the way these units worked is you had a probe, and I actually have the probe for this, but it's in another room and I didn't bring it out here. It has a switch in it that switches between a detector probe used for RF and a direct probe used for RF. But the switch is in the, uh, is in the probe itself. So, the magic eye tube is used to indicate the level and combined with these two sensitivity controls, you can actually get a fairly calibrated uh, reading and you certainly can get some very good relative readings. In other words, if you're trying to measure the gain of an IF stage, for example, you can do that. If you have the manual for this, or you go get, get it online, I think the Boat Anchor Manuals Archive has it, they'll, they'll talk about that in the manual, about how you do that. So, uh, once again, this is the night, uh, I think probably was originally released in about 55 or 56. This is the ICO, released about the same time, I'm going to say mid-50s. Uh, as the night. It's the model 145 and it is the earlier model of ICO. The, uh, this particular one, the inputs uh, are here. This is for your VTVM. In other words, you plug in a vacuum tube voltmeter here. And this is the output. Now, this came with a pair of probes, one for audio and one for RF. Once again, you can download this manual from the Boat Anchor Manual Archive, and it'll show you the details of what's inside those probes. I don't have the probes for this one. The gain control is here, once again the speaker. The uh, output control is basically the function control, and this light is just the power light. So there's no easy way on the front panel of this to read level. And that's why they have the VTVM connection so that you can attach a meter to it. And that's quite useful to have a meter. Uh, the 145 was fairly well known and fairly well regarded in the, in the early or, or mid 50s into about 1958 or 59. But the Knight, because it had some of these extra features, including the ability to access the uh, output transformer and the watt meter, the 145 was replaced by the 147. So let's take a look at that one. On this 
Model 147 made by Ico. Once again, this was also a kit. All of these first three were originally sold as kits. You'll see that they have added the Magic Eye Tube that was missing in the 145. They've added the connections to the output transformer, once again missing in the 145. They have also added the uh, output for the VTVM, or I should say have copied it from the 145. That's this one. There's a watt meter over here, very much like on the night. Once again, usually inaccurate. The, uh, the switch here is designed to select the uh, AC on and off, the trace position, uh, and I can't read that third one. But the, the basic gain is by this knob and the function over here. Now this one has a third function in addition to tracing uh, and measuring, it also has a noise function. That inserts a DC voltage onto the circuit to find particularly bad resistors. A lot of times carbon resistors go bad by uh, the inside uh, becomes loose and, and arcs. It creates noise in the circuit and uh, it, it's some people call it a frying sound. So the speaker here, you can turn the speaker on and off. You can uh, measure things on the eye tube, but you can also plug a meter in here, which is pretty useful. The probe on this one is shown here. This is sort of a standard ICO probe of the day. They use a very similar probe on their oscilloscopes and, and uh, a lot of other gear. So uh, the RF and AF switching is actually done by the function switch on the front panel, not by the, uh, not by the probe as in the night. So those are the three more or less vintage tube-based uh, signal tracers. There was a, another model of the 147 called the 147A. Uh, I have one. It has, uh, it's basically re-engineered version of this to reduce the cost. They removed a tube and made some other changes to the circuitry to lower the cost. Most people, myself included, think that the best of the bunch is the 147. There are some things about the 147 though that you should check into and Mr. Carlson's lab has a, a, a nice long video on that actually I think he, he used a 147A but, I, but it's basically, the, no I'm sorry, he used a Heath kit but it basically has some of the same defects this has which is there, DC is allowed to flow through this control, it's better to block that, it keeps the control from developing noise over, over time and some other things that uh, a lot of the things that uh, Mr. Carlson talked about in his video apply to all three of these in terms of ways you can fix them up and recalibrate. I think he even recalibrated his watt meter. So those are the vintage uh, signal tracers. Now let's take a look at a couple of more modern ones. This is a Tenma 72540 signal tracer and also a signal injector. It does basically the same thing that the vintage units do. do. Uh, it has a probe here, uh, an RF, AF switch, the uh, attenuator, a volume control for the signal tracer, a volume control for the signal injector, which we'll talk about in a second, and then the function switch that selects the various functions. One of the nice things about this one is it comes with a meter. That can be very, very useful, particularly in measuring relative stage gain. Now, if you work on radios very much, you quickly become familiar with about how much gain each stage should have. And the nice thing about a signal tracer with a meter, whether it's this one or one of the earlier ones with a meter connected to the output, is you can actually do a pretty accurate relative gain check on an IF, so especially the IFs, those were the hardest ones. You might say at this point, why in the world are they still building these things? After all, weren't these for old tube radios? The answer is no. Actually, 
Signal tracers and signal injectors are useful even right up to the present day. You can use this unit in a modern solid state AM FM tuner amplifier uh, or tuner amplifier combination. It's useful for both AM and FM. Uh, I'll talk about that in, in a future video. Uh, the so, a lot of the people who think that these are limited to working on old vintage tube radios, not true. They can be quite useful. Now, why wouldn't you just use an oscilloscope today? The reason is, most oscilloscopes do not have nearly enough gain to work at the front ends of a receiver, where the signal level can be in the microvolts or tens of, of microvolts often in the hundreds of microvolts, but still trying to measure a hundred microvolt signal on an oscilloscope is an exercise in frustration. The nice thing about these signal tracers, and the vintage ones as well as this one, they have enough gain that you can actually listen to a 100 microvolt signal at the input, say, to the IF uh, strain, and with a reasonably good ear, you can detect distortion, you can measure relative uh, IF gain and basically look for dead stages, uh, low gain stages. Maybe you've got a transistor that's given up the ghost or, or a coupling capacitor that's not working correctly or an IF transformer with a short or something of that sort. It really works well for RF. Now, I will admit that when you get into the AF sections of uh, receivers, either the old ones or the new ones. You're probably better off with an oscilloscope. But nonetheless, if all you can afford is one piece of equipment and you like to work on radios, this is probably as good as you can as you can get. They're not that expensive. I think Tenma still sells this. If not, they're probably available on eBay. So let's take one last look, speaking of, of cost, at an even cheaper alternative to the Tenma. This is an Alenco ST751 signal tracer and injector. It's a, a little kit that you at least could buy from Alenco. I think they still sell it, but maybe not. Uh, once again, if they don't still sell it, I'm sure there's a lot of used ones available on eBay. Simple volume control switch to select trace versus uh, inject. Instead of having an RF-AF switch, it has different connectors. So you ground this and then you use the, the red or the green depending on what you're doing. Now let's talk about injector because this in, has an injector capability just like the Tenma we looked at a, a minute ago. What the injector does is it inserts a signal hot, rich in harmonics and puts it out on, on the test lead. In doing that, when you touch that to a circuit, the, uh, if the circuit from that point to the speaker is, is alive and working, you'll get uh, a signal in the uh, speaker. And while it's pretty kludgy in terms of uh, the way it works. It's certainly not a lab measurement instrument. It nonetheless does work and helps you to isolate dead stages in radios pretty easily. So the, uh, the point is that the signal tracer, normally you are using the tracer in the early stages of the receiver, the IFs and, and maybe even into the converter or the RF amplifier. The injector normally you use uh, from the output back to the input, whereas the tracer you generally go the other way. In other words, you usually start out with the signal tracer on the volume control uh, slider of the volume control in the tracer audio position. If you have good audio there, then you know you sort of divided the, uh, the set in half. If you watched uh, a few videos I made on a Westinghouse radio, I talk about how you can sort of divide up the schematic into about four areas and, and break down what's going on in a radio pretty quickly. 
Uh, you might want to watch that if you're not familiar with the general method of, uh, of isolated stages. So this is also a fairly modern transistorized signal tracer. Now obviously there are lots more out there including some vintage ones. I didn't mention here the uh, Rider Channelist that I showed in an earlier video, later manufactured by RCA. That was a much fancier device uh, released in the late 30s. It was basically a tuned signal tracer along with some other features. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you might go look for that video. But at this point, what I'm going to do is end this overview of signal tracers. I hope to do a future video on using signal tracers in both AM and FM receivers. So I hope you enjoy this video and uh, hopefully in the near future I'll be able to get on to uh, troubleshooting in a real receiver with a signal tracer. Have a nice day.